The following is a presentation from the 8th Annual Humanities Days at Montgomery College. Together Apart, creating spaces for understanding and reimagining society. Due to the 2020 pandemic, all presentations were conducted through Zoom. To learn more about Humanities Days at Montgomery College and to access other program recordings, please go to this website. Ostensibly, the talk today is The Road to Unfreedom, Timothy Snyder's book. Uh, but I have thought about how to talk about it. So it's more of a conversation uh, about his book, about his book on tyranny, uh, the 20 lessons that came out in 2017, which led to his writing, The Road to Unfreedom. He has a new book out, but I'm not here to sell Timothy Snyder's book. I don't have any books to sell. I wouldn't let you read my master's thesis if you asked. But I will start with this. I think it's important uh, that we all remember from uh, the father of history, or at least the first one we have written down. Most people, in fact, will not take trouble in finding out the truth, but are much more inclined to accept the first story that they hear. And I am the first story you may be hearing. And I think it's very important that part of the lesson from this lecture could be that you don't trust me, that you go and check your sources that you go and listen to someone else uh, and find out for yourself. I have particular biases, particular places that I come from in my life. So think about that. So Timothy Snyder's book uh, comes as an answer to a feeling that many of us may have. Are we feeling uneasy about things at the moment? Have we been feeling off kilter, he uses the description of trying to find our sea legs. Um, I've heard this expression talked about a lot in the stuff that I read about disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, and so on and so forth, a sense of being unsure. So to start out, let's make sure everyone knows that you're, you're not alone in this. But that's where we're starting from, this understanding that we're, we feel a bit off balance. Mm -hmm. Let's go here. So I started out with this. Uh, I, this is Timothy Snyder, his talk at Politics and Prose back in 2018. Timothy Snyder is a very prominent guy at this point, and our, the way we transfer information has changed so much in the last six months. Do yourself a favor. You can find Timothy Snyder. You can find his YouTube channel. You can find his Yale page. You can, I mean, we're all out there in the digital world. So I, at the end of my presentation, I've provided a couple of links that, of the stuff that I looked at uh, to make this, put this talk together. But if Timothy Snyder wants us to understand that the point of history, the, the, his, the history of the present is to know where you are standing. If you know where you are standing, then you can choose which way you're going to walk. Okay, so we're thinking about that, not knowing where we're at, where we're going, and trying to find some sense of the history of the present. We do that through what he says he's got, his major theme is this idea that there are these forces, these relationships. The major premise is between what he calls the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity. Uh, and his solution to the problem of these two things is what he calls the politics of responsibility. So this is a very simple overview of what's in the book itself. Before we get to a conversation about on tyranny, the 20 lessons, because you know, the reason for the politics of responsibility will become clear and the lessons are a way for us to take responsibility. So the politics of an in, in, inevitability and the politics of eternity are, are ahistorical ways of looking at history. They are not real history. They are just ways to choose to look at history and ways that we, according to Timothy Snyder, have begun to do that, how we have done that. So one thing that we're suffering from here in the United States and Europe is suffering from and have been suffering from at least the 90s is what he calls the politics of inevitability. That since the world's history ended when the Berlin Wall fell down, 
we don't have to worry about things anymore because it's inevitable that the free markets will produce liberal democracy and the world will get better. So any problems that we may find along the way are just a product of this inevitable progress. So we're not to really do anything about it. We're just to kind of hang out and go along with that. Uh, there are other ways that this politics of inevitability he, he describes uh, is expressed in other cultures, other places. So we also have a, a politics of inevitability in Europe uh, where they have this, this European understanding of having learned a lesson from World War II like nobody else on the planet did. So they're smarter and they're wiser and their politics of in inevitability lends itself to the same sort of we may have some problems, but we just keep going with what we're going. It, we've learned from the past. We've created this system here at the, in the EU because of that. And that's why everything will be fine in the future. But one of Timothy Snyder's uh, more provocative points that he loves to bring up to the Europeans is that, that they have been lying to themselves. And that what we see the EU be is the EU is not learning their lesson an EU is a reaction to what happens when you lose your empires and you have nobody's resources to necessarily use for your profit. So it really was more of a, how do we deal with the fact that there is no longer a British empire? How do we deal with the fact there is no longer a French empire? How do we deal with the fact there is no longer a German empire and so on and so forth? There are some nations he says that get of, uh, get uh, get accepted from this, but it is in fact a way of dealing with that process. So their politics of inevitability, again, ahistorical. Um, the same thing you could look at the politics of inevitability can, can also be applied to um, communism and Marxism, the idea that we have this way that we're going to do these things and things are gonna work out in the end. So this politics of inevitability being ahistorical has created a situation where people have stopped believing in it. Um, it has come to a breaking point. A good breaking point might be considered to be 2008. With the economic collapse, this, oh, everything's always going to get better, didn't get better. It got really bad. It got really bad for a lot of people, and we still don't still don't know the ramifications of, of that economic downturn. Uh, there's some other things that he points out that I can't remember off the top of my head, but a Russian ruble collapse back in the 90s. Uh, you can just think over the last decade or so, uh, what people might, well, I don't wanna go into anything like that, but just the uh, lack of faith in, in the systems providing for what they claim they will provide for us. So, we have had a break, which has opened up the, what he calls the politics of eternity. The politics of eternity is more of seeing history as a series of cycles that are always returning on themselves. Um, it, it draws its power from the fact that the nation has always been, it's the most important thing it's always beset by some outside forces trying to destroy it. And all that matters is the state itself and the continuation of the state. We keep telling ourselves that whatever problems, before I go on to, it's the same sort of lack of alternatives. The politics of, of inevitability lend themselves, lends itself to the fact that there are no alternatives to what we already have. We have liberal democracy and the fact that there may be flaws in it doesn't make any difference. It's still gonna get better. So let's just not, not rock the boat. Let's not try to change things. Uh, the, the politics of eternity have the same his, a historical understanding where it's, it's the eternal national values that we can rely on that will always protect us. And so rather than look at ourselves with a critical eye as a nation or any nation looking at itself with a critical eye, it's always 
creating a new myth for itself, perpetuating the cycle of an idea that it's really about the state. So we stare at a, eventually, he calls it, describes it as we stare at a spinning vortex of cyclical myth until we fall into a trance and then we do something shocking at someone else's orders that because of the nature of the state, we're, we're stuck with only not, not looking into what we can do, but what we have to do to protect the state. It is the, uh, the old Sparta versus Athens. Uh, teleology is a, a system of knowledge that takes you to a place like uh, capitalism is the free markets will help us get to where we want to go. You, you believe the world in a certain organized fashion. So Marcus, Marxism is a teleology and uh, free market capitalism is a teleology that this is the way I understand it. Uh, what would qualify as something shocking is a great question. Let's come back to that. What is what qualifies as something shocking? Because Timothy Snyder is a professor of autocracy, a professor of what happened. His main, most famous book uh, is about the what happened in the after World War II in the Eastern European theater reprisals uh, and stuff like that. So his study of fascism from the past informs his understanding of what he's talking about to today. So you can think of things in the past as being shocking, but we might discuss some things that might be considered shocking today. So politics of eternity, both being ahistorical, neither one of them being where we're headed, where we really want to head as a society. He has an idea in the book about personal responsibility, the politics of responsibility. Essentially, um, Snyder's arguing from the beginning that we have raised a generation of people that don't believe in real history. They believe in these myths of history. Uh, and we have to be responsible for understanding that history is not something that ends. He wants to get rid of this notion that somehow or another, we no longer have to do things, whether it's because we believe that it's inevitable things will get better, or whether we believe it's, we believe it's because the state, the, the democracy we've created, the fascist state we've created, the, the, the kingdom we've created, whatever the organizing principle for the state is, that's the thing that we're actually trying to preserve. So the politics of responsibility understands that history is not something that is acted on us. We act on history. We create uh, what is going on around us. The people that created history in the past acted. They did not sit back and think about it. So politics of responsibility gives us a sense of there's some things that we have to do to participate in this conversation, participate in what comes next. So this is where I want to turn the conversation into these 20 lessons that come from Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny that came out in 2017 because it's a remarkable moment in our history in that we're just a few days away from an election. We are in a situation where the president is suggesting that he might not accept the results. Of course, if he says he's not going to accept the results, the Democrats are not going to do the, accept the results. There's so much, so much out there to try to process about this. We're now talking about the precedent of the 2000 Supreme Court ruling on Bush v. Gore, whether or not that is a precedent, even though it wasn't supposed to be a precedent. So there are a lot of things to be thinking about right now. And I just wanted to go through his lessons uh, and people can chat at me or unmute and have something to say if you'd like as we go through here. But I thought we'd go through the 20 lessons and then open it up for some conversation about do we see any of these things happening? My class has been exploring the idea of are we on the path that Timothy Snyder suggests that many of liberal democracies are on. Um, are we heading towards a ahistorical approach to our understanding of what the government is supposed to do or be? Uh, so let's start out. I, I didn't want to do too much text. So the first the first three that he points out do not obey in advance. Most of the power authoritarianism is freely given. 
In times like these, individuals think ahead about what more repressive government will want and offer themselves without being asked. A citizen who adapts in this way is teaching power what it can do. He makes the argument that appeasement, essentially, a kind of appeasement within the German people led to the Reichstag, led to Nazism, led to the, to the legal takeover of the Nazi party, I think is the point that he makes, that you just go along to get along. And I think that we can perhaps take a moment to think about examples of this having happened recently in our lives, whether or not we've seen members of our government, members of our military, private citizens, you know, are there people that are, without giving much thought to what they're doing, going ahead and doing what they're being told to do? Who are we listening to these days in these, inst in these instances? Uh, and that plays very well into the second lesson, which is to defend our institutions. It is the institutions that help us to preserve de decency. They need our help as well. Do not speak of our institutions unless you make them yours by acting on their behalf. Institutions do not protect themselves. They fall one after the other unless each is defended from the beginning. So choose an institution you care about a court, a newspaper, law, labor union, and take it aside. I won't bring into the conversation here this defending of institutions. I listened to him give a lecture to some um, German folk uh, in Berlin about whether or not the language of the new authoritarian govern governments in the world, are they fascists or not? And he loves to use the term, not even fascists. They're just quite shy of being fascists but this defending institutions, um, uh, we've, we've seen an erosion of those institutions in, in what we've seen going on lately. Um, but it plays the do, do not defend institutions, which institutions are most important to us at any given moment, I think is a good question. Uh, and I hope that I'm just posing a lot of just good questions. Uh, beware the one party state, the parties that made states and suppressed rivals, remade states and suppressed rivals were not omnipotent from the start. They exploited a historic moment to make political life impossible for their opponents. So support the multi-party state system and defend the rules of democratic elections, vote in local and state elections while you can and consider running for office. Uh, I wanted to say about the defending of institutions, I think I'm, I'm not an expert on Timothy Snyder, but having listened to him lecture several times and read some of his books, uh, he is more of that kind of historian that's a little frustrating in that he's apolitical, I believe. So he is, his criticisms are not meant for a side necessarily when he's talking about defending institutions. He makes a very good point that there has been within the discourse uh, on both sides of the political spectrum, language that is provided for the, dis the, the lack of trust in institutions. Now, some of it maybe perhaps is warranted, but there, have been, there has been talk on the left about not being able to trust the FBI, not being able to trust the military, and not being able to trust the Pentagon, and so on and so forth, just as much as we now hear something from the, from the right about who we should be trusting and whether we should be trusting them. So. I wanted to make sure I brought that one in from the good old Germans. Take responsibility for the face of the world. The symbols of today enable the, the, the reality of tomorrow. Notice the swastikas and the other signs of hate. Do not look away. Do not be used to them. Remove them from yourself. I will reveal about myself that I got to live in Berlin for a few years of my life and I didn't see any Nazi symbols anywhere. Um, and I did see was I came out of the U-Bahn uh, I saw a big sign that said names that we should never remember, never forget, and they were the names of the death camps. The, the Germans had an understanding of what to do with their symbols of hate and division. In our country, we have a totally different thing going on. And as a historian of the South, uh, I will say that we also have symbols of hate that many people have had a hard time recognizing them as such that we see all over the place. Um, and there are new ones. We have to recognize what people mean by symbols when they're being used. So you have to explore these things on your own. What, what does that symbol really mean? What is somebody waving it for? 
Does anybody know why you might see a young man walking around with a, an assault rifle and wearing a Hawaiian shirt? Is the Hawaiian shirt just a fashion statement or is there something else being demonst demonstrated there? Uh, remembering professional ethics. Uh, I try to model this myself as best as possible, but uh, we have to remember that uh, the point that Timothy Snyder makes in this chapter is that everything happened outside of professional ethics. If everyone who fell to totalitarian states had actually followed the law, followed what they understood to be the truth, then this we wouldn't have had these happen. So when political leaders set a negative example, professional commitments to just practice become more important. It is hard to subvert rule of law of state without lawyers or to hold show trials without judges. Authoritarians need obedient civil servants and concentration camp directors seek businessmen interested in cheap labor. We look for these things because we've seen it happen in the past. One of the things that he's trying to do, if we can remember what my theme to this lecture is, finding our place and understanding history, where we came from, so we know which direction to go. Be wary of paramilitaries, it's a particularly frightening one for me because I've watched over the last 30 years, the police force become militarized, unlike I had seen when I was in the military. And then I've seen the growth within our country of militias that claim an extra legal constitutional right to, to exist to protect our country. And I never, I had to understand that over the decades. It's been a struggle for me also. But when the men with guns who have always claimed to be against the system start wearing uniforms and marching with torches and pictures of a leader, the end is nigh. When the pro-leader paramilitary and the official police and military intermingle, the end has come. So it's a good question to see, to ask whether we've seen this sort of conduct in our country at the moment. Be reflective if you must be armed. The idea that we do have people under arms as we speak who are entrusted with the public safety, public service. If you carry a weapon in public service, this is not if you're a person that's carrying a private weapon, this is in public service. Thank you, but know that evils of the past involve policemen, soldiers finding themselves <clears throat> one day doing irregular things, being ready to say no. I found this one particularly good. It's an interesting one because Churchill happens to be very popular nowadays. Uh, stand out. Someone has to. It's easy to follow along. It can feel strange to do or say something different, but without that unease, there is no freedom. Rosa Parks is always a great example. The moment you set an example, the spell of the status quo is broken and others will follow. And I know that Howard would love to chime in right now and say, Rosa Parks didn't do that one day. She didn't just wake up one day and say she was pissed off and decide to do it. She had been fighting her whole life. She had been fighting amongst people who had been fighting their whole lives. We just like to pretend that it was that one moment. So we all have to keep doing it. Or it's important that, that we stand out for the right things, that we go ahead and speak out when we see things that are wrong. And speaking of speaking out, so be kind to our language. Avoid pronouncing the phrases everyone else does. Think up your own way of speaking, even if it only to convey the thing you think everyone is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet. Read books. Make it more complicated. Don't make it simple. It's never simple. And if somebody says that it's simple, they're lying. It's complicated. So that's why the lecture that Timothy Snyder gave, on, and it's at the end, the link, about the language. Language is a particular way we categorize someone as being fascist and the difference between what we know to have been fascism back in the 30s and 40s and what we can perhaps call fascism today um, are very different but are very similar in some of their use of language uh, but even using the word is itself calling someone a fascist is not being kind to our language, understanding that someone that I'm having a discussion with about whether or not Americans should have health care or we should fund the military, uh, I shouldn't be calling them a fascist. That's not the case. Um, Timothy Snyder has been very vocal about the use of the word extremism. 
because extremism is used by authoritarian states to call anyone that doesn't agree with the, the authority of the state an extremist. It might have happened in this country, but came, came before I was born, so I don't know. I, I'm sure it's been perfect since I was a young man. But uh, one of the techniques of disinformation, misinformation that the world is suffering right now according to many people, but particularly by Timothy Snyder, but also security, cybersecurity experts, is that we're being flooded, the zone is being flooded with SHIT as it were, that there is so much untruth that it's impossible to find the truth. And that is the idea. Remember the politics of the inevitable and the politics of the eternal, both require an ace historical understanding. Facts don't matter. What matters is that progress is coming or the state will survive. Facts don't really matter. So believe in the truth. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle. The biggest wallet pays for most the most blinding lights. One of the points that Snyder makes about spectacle is an interesting one about succession. One of the problems we see happening in the totalitarian states, and we've always seen in totalitarian states, who takes over in the end when the great leader who's controlling everything dies? Succession is a problem. So in democracy, we might not always like it, but we do appreciate having a, a, a succession. We, we vote someone in, we think, oh my goodness, they're terrible, we vote them out and so on and so forth. But we continue to have a voice. Whereas in unfreedom, you lose that voice. And one of the ways you lose that voice is by not believing in some form of truth. So that requires investigation, of course. A constant, figure things out for yourself. I'm just me. I used to install furniture. I was an infantryman during the Cold War. Don't trust me. Go out there and find out for yourself. Find different sources of information. Figure things out for yourself. Spend more time with long articles. Subsidize investigative journalism by subscribing to print media. Yeah, whatever that means anymore. There are different people that we have to pay, we have to help out because they're the ones doing the investigative journalism. As much as I would claim that the fourth estate is as much a fifth column as it is helping us out, uh, it needs our help, but it can also harm us. So, but it needs our help. So. Those people that have found out the information that we keep that's just rolling out, it wasn't the courts, it wasn't the lawyers, it wasn't the law enforcement, it was journalists. It was that fourth estate that really has kept freedom afloat. I, I recommend a movie called Mr. Jones about sometimes the failings of the free press. That's another conversation. Make eye contact and small talk. Those of you that know me, you're gonna like, Dave loves this one because this is the way I grew up. I used to live in a small town. I used to live in a small community. I get to say to hi to everybody, even when I'm walking around downtown DC, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Uh, but it's really important. It's not, this is not just polite. It's part of being a citizen and responsible member of society. It is also a way to stay in touch with your surroundings, break down social barriers and understand whom you should and should not trust. If we enter a culture of denunciation, you will want to know the psychological landscape of your daily life. It's very important to have personal interactions with people, to know people and not just be afraid of people all of the time. Um, keep growing. Corporeal politics. In many of his lectures, he brings up the point that the both the politics of the inevitable and the politics of the eternal don't want anyone out in the street. They don't want anyone hanging out with one another talking about this stuff because there's nothing to talk about. Everything's going to be fine. We don't need to fix problems. Climate change isn't, maybe it's real, but who cares? Um, things like that. So Timothy Snyder would suggest that you practice corporeal politics. Power wants your body softening in a chair. Get your emotions dissipating on the screen. Yell at Twitter. Get on Facebook. Yell at your family. But it's important to make new friends. Find people and march with them, he would say. And I tell you, it gives me a shiver in my bones having grown up the way I did in the household I grew up in. The idea that anybody's supposed to protest the government is anathema to the character that I was that I developed as a young man. But it's important to march, I have found. It's important to put your body out there and say, I'm a member of this society. 
that is saying we have to move forward. Establish a private life. This is an interesting one in our particular circumstances. Nastier rulers will use what they know about you to push you around. So this is Timothy Snyder's attempt to get you to understand what's happening in the world today, and none of us really can. Technology is sucking our lives into a giant computer mainframe and creating some matrix-like thing that is manipulating the way we do things everywhere. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And I, I'll invite you to my next lecture about this particular phenomenon when we talk about surveillance capitalism. But um, it's hard to have a private life. But if you're out there like we are, you have to expect that people are going to know and perhaps use it against you, that you're not being private, that you're willing to stand out. So other ways of communicating with one another is not a bad idea. Contribute to good causes. Uh, I think we all do, especially those of us that are uh, participating in the Humanities Day's events this week, you're contributing to a good cause. So be active in any organization, political or not, that express your own view of life. Pick a charity or two, set up an auto pay, and then you will have made a free choice that supports civil society and helps others do good. I remember the thousand points of light. I think my Professor Lieberg will remember the importance of the thousand points of light. You know, there are two views. There have been a competing views of government for a long time now. Uh, and we need to bring those two views together with this understanding that, well, we, we both like it here. We both love our country. So, you know, we have to understand that there are ways that the government can help, that the people can't help, and there are ways that the people can help that the government can't help. And let's, let's find that balance of understanding. Man, we could all use a little help now and then. All right, learn from others, learn from peers in other countries. Some people have been yelling at us since the early double aughts about what was coming because they were seeing it happen. And we didn't pay attention because we were caught up in the politics of inevitability. And we were caught up in the politics of eternity. And we weren't listening to the fact that the Russians had done a denial of service attack on countries in uh, the Baltic states. We didn't pay attention to what was going on. Timothy Snyder will go on in the book he uses as an example, starting in 2012 particularly, you see a, a real um, ramp up of Russian efforts against the EU and the United States as a way of undermining the idea of liberal democracy. Um, and we could have seen that. We could have seen that in the Ukraine, the Russians hacked in, stole data, used it against opponents supported the totalitarian, didn't try to sow discord. They actually framed, I thought this was wondering, I'm not gonna talk about Putin's philosopher, but I would encourage you to look these guys up. They're a lot of fun. Um, there's a couple of philosophers. I didn't see Dugan's name in here, but um, the, um, the sexualization of history is a lot of fun. Uh, but we could have learned one of the ways that this information was spread in the Ukraine revolution was that it was it was framed by propaganda as a cabal by the LGBT community to establish a homoocracy uh, and that they had to be stopped. So I think that we can agree that I, personally, I mean, a homoocracy sounds like a pretty darn good idea to me, but uh, let's move forward. Listen for dangerous words. Be alert to the use of the words like extremism and terrorism, be alive to the fatal. We actually, some of us don't want them throwing that word terrorism around. We didn't want it before. And we don't want to start making, we don't necessarily want to start calling the guys that are wearing the camouflage of the Boogaloo shirts and the guns. We don't necessarily want to start calling them terrorists either because remember what we did in 2001 to people we called terrorists. And we never paid, Timothy Snyder would say one of the reasons why we're where we're at is because we didn't do anything about that. So listen for dangerous words. Be careful who's calling who what and using them ourselves. Very important. Um, be calm when the unthinkable arrives. This was the one that hit me first because I was more of a history of World War II than I was anything about autocracy and I didn't know anything. But be calm when the unthinkable arrives. I've been waiting for this one for the last five years. We had an event similar to this in 2001. When things happen, we get all amped up. 
everybody gets amped up. So modern tyranny is terror management. The reason that Putin is still in power in Russia is because of his terror management. Terrorist attacks that were exceptional moments in history that led to exceptional laws. Things had to be different because look at this, things are different now, we're being attacked. It happened here as well, of course, we need to remember. When terrorist attacks come, remember that authoritarians exploit such events in order to consolidate power. The sudden disaster that requires the end of checks and balances, the dissolution of opposition parties, the suspension of freedom of expression, the right to a fair trial, all of this comes from this idea that this moment in time is so exceptional, we have to throw out our principles and this is Korematsu, okay? This is the understanding that sometimes the, the federal government, the president has to prosecute the war even if he has to break the law to do it. This happens sometimes and we have to be calm and say, no, Mr. President, you're not allowed to do that. We have to be willing to stand up and say that there are checks and balances. That's the reason they created the system. So we need to be calm. We need to be calm now because we don't know what's about to happen, but we can be sure we're in for a wild ride. I love living history. I used to think it was over too. <laughs> All right, so here, talk about loaded words. Uh, the word patriot, be a patriot. My goodness, when I had my students read this word, I shiver because patriot to me has come to mean what the radical people call it, not necessarily what I grew up calling it. Uh, that word is loaded. Who is a patriot? Because I used to think that only the people in military maybe were patriots. I didn't think Frank Little was a patriot. And if anybody knows who Frank Little is, or I didn't necessarily know that Shirley Chisholm was a patriot. I didn't understand what a patriot was. So Timothy Snyder does a good job of saying there's a big difference between being a patriot and being a nationalist. So what does it mean to be a patriot? has to do with what the principles are founded on. And these again become, you have to develop your own values in that respect. What are the values that the country are founded on? Free speech, freedom of religion, you know, the things that are enshrined in the, the, the Bill of Rights. Uh, allowing for these things to be true of all of us allows our society to be better. And this one, I can't believe I gave this to my students again. Uh, this was what was handed to me though, essentially when I joined the army at 17, you're here to die. Uh, I don't think you're here to talk, but Timothy Snyder is saying, be as great as you can be. That might mean just being willing to put your face on camera, um, being willing to step up and say your name. It doesn't mean you got to be Tiananmen Square Tank Man. Um, we might need Tiananmen Square Tank Man, uh, but I don't like the idea. I personally, I can't say as I've gone as far as pacifism at this point, but I don't like to hear about violence at all. Howard and I have have talked about his uh, John Brown metaphor a couple of times because of that, but uh, uh, be as courageous as you can be. So that, that really doesn't have to mean that we have to be willing to die. Uh, but eventually when this thing happens, people do die. And we see that happening around the country, around the world, right? Not the country. Yeah. So here's my, one of my last slides. This is how I inspire conversation. By embracing the politics of inevitability, we raise a generation without history. How will these young Americans react now that the promise of, in, of in, in, inevitability has been so obviously broken? Okay, I think I was raised in a moment of this politics of inevitability. I think the 1980s, particularly for people that look like me, were a time where we said, oh, everything's just gonna get better. And then when we won the Cold War, are you kidding me? I mean, I actually served on the Berlin Wall. The wall came down. I get to say I ended the Cold War. So I was, I thought it was over. Of course, then I traveled to the Middle East uh, and I found that the history was not over. It keeps going. We keep making decisions about our history. So what's gonna happen to the younger generation? Uh, who do we consider a younger generation is a great question because I think of myself as being quite young still, but I have much younger students. So I thought that was a, a good way to, uh, I'll, I'll keep it here. And just, just in case we're, we end up becoming a YouTube phenom, I needed to quote Marx right here at the end. 
uh, history repeats itself first as tragedy, second as farce. And it, Timothy Snyder wants to, everyone to understand a farce is really a funny thing unless it's happening to you. And then it's not funny anymore. I'm, uh, I have completed my responsibility that I've been worried about for the last several months. And I hope I didn't offend anyone. I hope I made people think about things. And if anybody has anything to say, I personally believe in a little bit of anarchy. Unmute and holler out or text me that you'd like to unmute and holler out, but I have no control over it. I think there may just be three of us here anyway, but I'm not sure. I don't know how to use Twitter. I don't know how to use this thing very well. Any questions? I have a comment. Okay, Howard, please. Comments are better than questions because I don't know answers. Yeah, th this was very good. I, I, I learned a lot and got a few things confirmed. But one, one question I have, and I know all of us here that our professors have, is uh, how can I be better at getting students to, uh, what's the best way to say that, to discern what are reliable sources and which aren't? I mean, I, uh, as you know, I'm about as low tech as possible. I'm not on social media. I have no interest in getting constant Facebook posts showing somebody's brother-in-law's dog playing piano. I'm an old, I'm an old curmudgeon. Um, I don't read this stuff, but I'm very out of touch. I remember in the faculty room at, uh, at Rockville a year or so ago, I was reading a book and one, one student stopped by and expressed amazement that I was actually reading a physical book, which you mentioned, David. So, um, and I, I really have trouble with this, not just with citations, but I've actually had students in class uh, mention in support of things that they said, groups like uh, Nostradamus, I'm not making this up. Nostradamus. And, yeah, some other uh, strange group that believes in, in, in events being preordained. I mean, I, I was talking about ways that they could address a certain issue like immigration. And well, this young woman raises her hand and says, well, according to the Etruscans, that's not it, or whoever they are, you know, it's hopeless anyway. And I mean, I, I am really, I really struggle sometimes how to, uh, I know they're not going to get off the, the internet, but um, anybody that has strategies for this, uh, I would really help because those, those filters that you mentioned that we grew up with, you know, they, they are gone. Yeah, I, I think that all of my students can very easily answer this with an acronym that I've taught them. And I think it would be great to see them chatting that to everyone. Uh, but it's easier. There is a whole complex world of cybersecurity and data security and things like that that exist out there. But a very simple process to just make sure that you're not missing out on something is to apply what they call the crap test. Uh, and it's somebody came up with it once upon a time, and it's not at all profound, but it is just use the acronym CRAP that stands for currency. What I'm reading, is it recent? Does it, does it actually fit? Is it old or new relative to what I'm trying to understand? Is it really relevant to the question at hand? Was I trying to understand whether or not to wear a mask and it took me down some path about whether or not government scientists are trustworthy? Uh, so is it relevant to what I'm trying to understand? What is the authority upon which this is based? Is this a person I'm listening to and authority in the field? What are their credentials? Or is it coming from someplace that would have an authority? You can also look, of course, for simple accuracy in things that you're looking at. If you see errors, then you can start assuming a lack of thought, a lack of concern for truth. So just any errors start to give you some questions. So as an English professor, it is incredibly troublesome to see misprints in headlines because then I have a hard time trusting the rest of the article but it is what it is. Uh, and then finally, what uh, the most important thing is the purpose for which the document or the uh, artifact or the object was made. Why did someone decide to put that in print or make a video of that? And if you find out why they made it, you probably can figure out whether or not you can trust them. Now, there's always deeper things that are things like funding 
uh, which is always interesting. And then I love to, the, the one that I have at least my 101 students walk away from is at least look up the credentials, at least be able to tell me who this person is that you've chosen to take their reasoning. Even the wrongest person on some things can have the right answer on something else. So I don't mind if you bring me a bad source, as long as you know you understand bad source, perhaps I have to question their judgment on the thing. But so, yes, thank you, Heather, for everyone. Please look at that. There is actually a Humanities Days event, Howard, that addresses this very issue. And I believe we're now waiting until the last minute to send out the links to the email. So if you look at the Humanities Days event, there is a, a, a workshop on this already planned, if it hasn't yeah. occurred yet. That, that's very helpful, that crap test. And um, you know, it it's, is, not and just, it's, it, it's not just in academia. I mean, sometimes the misinformation doesn't necessarily have a bad purpose. It's just, I think of what you said about authority. I mean, I've got, I've got people in my family, uh, friends who are well-meaning, and they, and they give advice all the time in emails and stuff uh, about how to deal with COVID med and medical advice. And it's just ridiculous. My doctor, um, she just retired. I think she's tired of it. But she said uh, patients actually come into her with, with internet articles that they have printed out um, diagnosing and, and, and suggesting certain treatments. I mean, do you really want somebody with a high school or just an undergraduate, you know, education telling you how to deal with medical things. It's, it just was, it's just, it's still shocking to me. It just shows how old I am. <laughs> a lot of things show how old you are, Howard. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, the color. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? Anybody want to bring up anything about any of the points that the lessons, I mean, is anybody, uh, you know, any of these lessons jump out at anyone as being particularly prescient? This is from 2017, so we already knew where we were headed. One of the things that, that I found most chilling in the last year was watching footage from Kenosha of the police meeting up with the paramilitary that Kyle, what's his name, was with and throwing them water bottles and thanking them for being there. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, holy crap, what yeah. are we, what are we in the middle of? Um, well, this, and and this... also, also watching the military, the, the National Guard and, and the police tear gas peaceful protesters in front of the White House on June 2nd. Uh, it was, it yeah, was nothing true. I'd ever seen before. Yeah, I think it's important. This goes to one of his, this goes to the, the professional ethics that in both instances, the Rittenhouse thing, we have a problem within the police force. Uh, we have a problem within the military. It's not always admitted, but there are white nationalist organizations. We know that the FBI has alerted us to the fact that our real, the real threat is domestic terrorism. It is from white nationalist or Western chauvinist organizations. Uh, but the professional ethics, I think, is the thing that saves us even within the police force. The police don't want bad police any more than soldiers want bad soldiers. The most outrageous thing that Trump has done is pardon war criminals to everybody that's ever worn the, the uniform. And I, I'll argue with anyone else that wants to who's worn the uniform, but we don't pardon war criminals. Um, so, yes, Carol. Can I make a point? Um, well, I, first of all, this flashed into my mind from uh, the 60s. We, a very common bumper sticker, 60s and 70s, was question authority. And I wish it would come back. Both people would use more bumper stickers. But uh, that also, the lining up with uh, following authoritarian uh, leaders, um, there was a, there's a very famous scene in War and Peace where uh, a soldier has become very comfortable with a, one of the prisoners and uh, you know they build up a relationship and then the drum roll starts and that soldier you know that relationship is curtailed because he lines up and, and does what he's supposed to do. Uh, I don't remember if they're shooting people at that point but um, it does it, we, we get groomed to how we're supposed to behave um, and uh, the signals uh, come on and and uh, rouse uh, rouse people in the wrong way. So that's all. I'm I'm chatting to people while I'm listening, Carolyn. I think that it's interesting <laughs> that there is 
generationally so many different things, uh, the passage of time. And it, it is, I think, one of Timothy Snyder's points that we, we, we're not sure where we're at in time. And it's all of us are in different moments in our own personal time. It makes it hard sometimes to come around on these very fundamental points. I would add too that, you know, this, this riot year, uh, whether, yeah, and, and or the police in, in the uh, more militarized uniforms, it really draws such a harsh line between citizens and uh, quote unquote caretakers. You know, when the police just had uh, black shirts and, you know, a badge on, um, uh, they, they didn't look all that different. And then they, they put on this uh, shell of protection and it really says, we're us and you're, you're you. Uh, well, I will go back to uh, the professional ethics thing. The other thing is, is that we did have General Milley. We did have a military that very quickly came out and said, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I just participated in what I participated in. And it goes back to do not obey in advance. And the oath that soldiers have is to the Constitution. It is to actually not obey un illegal orders. So it is, again, a professional ethic. Uh, we we're not we're not having a discussion about war ethics. We're having a discussion about peace ethics. Uh, and uh, true, yeah. yeah. I we, we we grew up. I don't know the '80s again. I, I I'm a victim of uh, of excess. You know. I think it's interesting that a lot of boomers. I uh, wish I could remember the name of the author right now who's written about how um, the generation that became us before us Gen Xers created, you know, lived in this utopia of a brand new society built on the ashes of the rest of the world because the rest of the world is destroyed. And so of course they all have great jobs and great retirements and make a lot of money. And they figured out how to pull the ladder up behind them in their retirement and create a society that does not allow for anyone else to have that same opportunity. Uh, and so that's a different generational, different ways of looking at <laughs> These, these different moments in our history. I, I got lost on that. Any questions about anything else? We are over time and I don't want to keep anybody, particularly my students, you guys are, uh, you need to roll out and take tests or something like that, I'm sure. But I, I welcome a few more conversations. Uh, thank you very much for your, the, the, the presentation. And um, I think you're, you're relying on Snyder as a good example of uh, somebody that satisfies the crap test. I never thought I'd be saying that in that context. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he, he is such a careful researcher. And uh, um, I'm not as, as progressive or whatever as I am. I've never been much of an alarmist um, because I have worked things through the system. But, but I will tell you, if things go, go south in this election or if they're, it's somehow contested and comes out the wrong way, then how different are we really from from a society that uh, could tip the wrong way as, as Germany did in the 30s. After all, Germany um, at the time, um, you know, they were probably even more, quote, civilized or, uh, or whatever than we were, certainly ahead of us in uh, education, culture, science, um, et cetera. This stuff doesn't just happen in, you know, downtrodden, desperate countries. Um, yeah, and it is a, it's a constant, there's always been a struggle between conservatives and progressives, and the, the German state was yeah, run by conservatives, yeah. but catered to progressive interests, and created a social safety net that even Winston Churchill in the 19-teens said was an envy of the world. Uh, so yes, that's another reason why the Europeans tend to think of themselves as being a lot smarter than the rest of us. In many ways, they are. They have lived through things that we haven't necessarily as a nation lived through. And that's why I think it's, it's, I appreciate this forum and I appreciate what you're giving to the people who are in their teens and 20s. Um, because one of the things that makes me nervous is that my son, who is in his 20s, is not comfortable with how upset I've gotten at recent events. Um, the, the briefing by Radcliffe the other day. Um, and, and he said, what are you so upset for? Calm down. And I'm like, no, we can't calm down. And I think it's important that people 
that folks in their 20s, I don't want to sound like a geezer, but that folks in their 20s um, are aware that this is not normal, that this is not what's been going on for the last 50 years. Yeah, I, I think it's so funny. I, I had a political awakening over the course of my education in life uh, and just to the point where I was starting to get comfortable again with uh, a, a sense of patriotism where I could be proud of the country, then this happens. And so I, I, I remember when I first started teaching, it was, you know, we could trust these .gov sites. You know, that was the, if we looked at that .gov, we knew we could trust it, but I can't say that anymore. Uh, and that is really awakened to me like what I had already regretted was that I was not a political participant for the first 30 years of my life because I was apolitical because I was under the impression that everything was fine. Uh, the politics of the inevitable had already taken over my mind and I was part of the Reagan revolution. Everything's good. What's the problem? Stop complaining. Uh, and I now understand history in a much different way. And to back to what we were talking about, a constant struggle between conservatism and progressivism and the idea of pushing forward and holding back and pushing forward and holding back and trying to find the, the balance between the two of them. Uh, and I think Timothy Snyder does a good job of putting us in a balance between the two of them. Nobody is saying one or the other. What we're saying is let's keep the democracy so we could keep talking about it. Because there is a path to not democracy through this uh, through this uh, politics of the eternity, you stop caring. Through this politics of inevitability, you stop caring. And the society we live in is based on what we do with it. <laughs> so if we don't care, then of course it doesn't, it deteriorates. It's like an organism that's not being fed. My students are always so kind, they're so obedient. You guys, I'm sure you have lives. I hate to keep you going. I have other presentations that are, that are going on too. So we should probably end the conversation here. I wanna thank everyone for attending my TED talk. Uh, <laughs> it, I hope it wasn't too much of a rally, but you know, go us. And I, I really mean that this is not a, an American phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. And we are all in this as a world together. What is happening in England right now, Snyder points out that Brexit was one of the things we could have learned from to protect ourselves in 2016. 2015 was manipulated by Facebook data shared with Cambridge Analytica, who then micro-targeted black people and micro-targeted progressives. And what I wanted to at one point bring up was that this, this idea that we're the anti-government movement and in many ways comes from the left as well. We have to repair our language when we talk about I can't trust the government. I understand why some people may have grown up not trusting the government. The government has done some terrible things to people, but we have to figure out how to teach people to recognize that it is of our creation. If we create it in, our, in a better image, we have a better system. Um, but seriously, I could talk forever and I probably shouldn't. So Roberta, thank you for stopping by. It was great meeting you. And everyone else that I don't know and all of my students and everybody, thank you very much for letting me rant about this. And now maybe I'll get back to my teaching duties. <laughs> <laughs>